Hey everybody, my name is Tina Hurley with Less Leg More Heart. We're an organization that's a 501c3 tax exempt charity that helps people in the disability population in a variety of ways. We do peer mentorship, medical advocacy, we fund holistic approaches to care, and we fund services uh, when people are transitioning from rehab and hospitals home and need things uh, that make them safer and more comfortable for them and their support systems. Really excited today to be meeting with a bunch of friends, um, first, uh, first and foremost friends, but also beneficiaries of our program. And we're going to talk about a topic every so often at intervals that has to do with relative uh, content. And today I'd like to talk about handicapped spaces. I want to talk about specifically violations of handicapped spaces. It's a big issue right now, especially with the weather turning cold and the holidays coming up. And each of the folks that I've selected for this Zoom meeting are folks that have a disability and have been in the community for a while and understand the challenges that this presents um, to them, to their families, to their loved ones, and to the community as a whole. So without further ado, I'd like for each person that's here to just let you know who they are and then we'll get into it. Liz. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm from Boston. Um, I'm an amputee and it, uh, today marks my fourth week of my amputation surgery. And Amanda. Hi, I'm Amanda Lewis. I'm from Bemidji, Minnesota. If you're not familiar where that's at, it's about 100 miles south of the Canadian border. Um, I've been an amputee for a little over 20 years. Hi, my name is Joe. I live in Dallas, Texas, and <clears throat> I'm an incomplete quadriplegic, and I've been uh, injured for almost 12 years now. Hi, I'm Shallon. I'm from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, I've am an above-the-knee amputee since January. Um, that's about it for me. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Colin Buchanan. I live in Chicago, Illinois. I'm a T4 paraplegic. I actually just hit 15 years, uh, November 5th here, 2020, so. Hey, my name is Q. I'm from uh, Plano, Texas. Um, incomplete spinal cord in injury. Uh, it's been a year now, and that's about it. Awesome, thank you all for being here. Really excited. And uh, let's jump into it. So I actually wanted to share first a statistic. It looks like the folks that are the statisticians have redone statistics and it seems like in the US, 26% now of folks that live in the US, adults that live in the US have a disability. And I mean, that's, that's one in four, right? You get four people in a room, one in four of those folks have a disability. And in the ADA, which are the folks that govern handicapped parking spaces, I believe right now the rules are that for every 25 spaces, one of them has to be a handicap designated spot. So that's 1 25th. But we're talking about the population is one fourth of folks that have a disability. So already these spots are in demand. Already that number would be six handicap spots to serve the actual number of folks that have a disability in any given group of people, 24, 25, um, in the population. So we're already at a deficit of spots um, and we're already in a position where we need to be aware that they're there for a reason. And that parking there just for a second or just to run in real quickly or oh because I didn't see it marked or no one ever parks in these spots or whatever the things are for convenience is a bigger issue. Um, there are visible and invisible disabilities as we know. Some of the hardest challenges for me uh, were before I was amputated when I had a very ischemic, meaning lacking in blood flow foot, and I really couldn't walk very far, um, I would get sort of discriminated against because I looked normal. So the disclaimer to this conversation is that we want to protect those spots. We want to report violators that are in those spots. We want to protect folks with disabilities, but we also want to maintain an eye of non-judgment for folks that have an accurately displayed placard or plate because just because we can't see that they're not disabled doesn't mean that we know their whole story. I mean, folks with invisible disabilities or people that have suffered multi-trauma have, you know, multiple screws and plates throughout their body that you won't see. They're not using accessibility equipment all the time. They may have lung disease or heart disease or some kind of chronic pain condition that renders them unable to get from the very back of that overcrowded Walmart parking lot at the holidays 
to the front of the store at any position where they can actually shop. So just, you know, non-judgment is great, but if you do see people that don't have plates or placards, there are ways that you can do something. I wouldn't necessarily recommend confronting folks, uh, but you can call the authorities and the fees are pretty significant. I think it's like 250 is the cheapest ticket I've seen for people parking in uh, parking spots that are handicap designated. So just be mindful of that, that you can call the authorities. And in fact, it's recommended. There's even apps. Some of you guys might know of the apps. I forget the name of the one that I used formerly, but you can go on, take pictures of the license plate of the car that's in the spot and it will automatically route it to the local PD. And what they do with it at that point, I guess, is what they do with it. Their processing could be slow, but at least you feel like you're doing your part to help solve the problem. Um, I also wanted to mention that there are two types of uh, spots. So there are regular spots. You will see them clearly designated with a handicap sign. It will usually say handicap space. Um, it might list the fee that's on it. But there are also spaces that are um, in between areas of hash marks. Usually they're blue, sometimes they're yellow. Those are designated for vans, wheelchair accessible vans. And before I became disabled, I didn't really know um, how much space a van needed to be able to get somebody in and out of the vehicle to have access to a property. And those hash marks, every bit of those are necessary. A ramp has to come out that has a degree to it that's able for the person to be able to propel up it in their wheelchair. And that usually takes a large part of that hash area. So if people are parking too close next to it, if bikers or other people feel that that's their spot, you're wrong. Uh, those need to be as clear as the spots are clear unless you have a designated handicap plate. It is not somewhere for you to pull your vehicle. It's not uh, an extra spot that someone happened to put hash marks on instead of it being open. It's there for a reason and it's law. So please be mindful that those spots are in fact going to inhibit a person in a wheelchair from physically accessing that, build, that building. There was a study that was done by Braun Ability that actually looked at handicap violators. I think that their campaign was called Save My Spot. Yeah, it was the Save My Spot campaign that they had done. And they asked people, they said, what, if, you were, <laughs> if, you, if you were parking too close to another vehicle, or if a vehicle parked too close to you, and you couldn't open your door, how would you get out? And these folks said, well, I would roll the window down and have to climb out the window. Well, people in wheelchairs or people that have physical impairments can't climb out a window just to get out of their vehicle to the store. I know it sounds silly, but this is, this is truly an issue with creating isolation, lack of inclusion, and missed opportunities for folks that have physical impairments simply because of ignorance that can be fixed. So just know that you, know, you need to give space. Assume that everybody has a handicapped wheelchair or a handicap um, you know, disability and that they need to get their wheelchair out of a ramp and out of their vehicle, unless otherwise, that, that is the assumption. The other study I thought that was relevant was that Braun Ability also ran the same campaign and they asked able bodies if they had seen somebody that had violated parking in these spots. 74% of people in the population had actively witnessed people violating handicapped parking places. They didn't follow it up by saying how many of you have done something or what did you do? But the fact that three quarters of people surveyed were, were witness, direct witness to these violations means that it's a pretty big issue. And I looked into some statistics, just in Houston alone in 2015, over that one year period, over 16,000 citations were written, tickets were written for handicapped space violations. If you think about the impact of that in every city and every town throughout the, the whole country, and we're really creating a situation where we're inhibiting people with disabilities from accessing the world and involving themselves in the ways that they should be able to, they, should, they have a right to, to. So this is the issue. I want you guys to know that the ADA is the governing body for this, that there are different kinds of spots, that it's a big problem, that as the weather gets colder and as the holidays draw more people out to these stores, it becomes a bigger issue and the lure for people to just park there real quick becomes greater. And what I'm hoping through this segment that people will recognize is that there are faces to those spots and that there is an impact to you taking that spot just for a second that could really create a negative situation for folks. Um, and so that's what these wonderful people are here to share with you today. So I'm gonna jump into questions for the group. Let's see if we've got some good stories for people to share. The first question that I have for the group is, do you have a personal story related 
to handicap space violations. I know there's lots of them out there. Some are funny, some are concerning, some are altercations, um, but I'm gonna mute myself and whoever has a story, jump on and share it with us. Yeah, sure, I can go first. I was actually living in Seattle, Washington at the time. And I mean, it's a pretty standard story, kind of what you touched on, those hash marks. People kind of think of those as a, an extra spot. Um, and I, exactly, I was going to the grocery store and I, I went in and I did my shopping and I actually came out and there was a car parked so close to me that I couldn't get into my car. Now I utilize a manual wheelchair, so I need actually, you know, I don't necessarily have a ramp van, but I do need to be able to open my door pretty wide to be able to disassemble that chair, get it into the car and to take off. So, I mean, it, it really forced me to be in a situation where I'm, I'm on this person's time now. You know, not my errands are no longer important. Wherever I had to go, I might have been on the way to a next doctor's appointment or something like that. Um, luckily, my schedule was pretty free and I could sit there and wait for this person to kind of come out. Uh, and this was a number of years ago, so I, I let them know a piece of my mind. This individual wasn't necessarily very <laughs> uh, receptive of this and kind of gave me a little bit of an eye. And, and, you know, we had a few words. I didn't really get too heated, but I said, listen, this is, this is kind of unacceptable. You've now made me very, very late for a lot of different things, potentially. Um, you know, if I had to go to an important, an important appointment, this is something that I might have had to reschedule. I've been sitting here for 15 minutes, you know, um, you know, please just make sure that you don't park here if you don't necessarily need it next time. And they absolutely did, you know, as a young person and, and they were in and out. Um, so just being cognizant of that. And also, um, you know, just making sure that you're not a violator yourself when you park in those, because I do need that extra space. So I'm always cognizant of that uh, hash line, even as a disabled person, that it is for somebody with a ramp van. So if I'm if I'm parking there, I don't just kind of take up the whole thing and throw up that placard and get out all privileged, right? Um, no, you need to make sure that you kind of you you park your vehicle with just enough space for you to utilize it, and the other person can come out as well. So. It's really just a courtesy to other people's day and kind of time and space for all of us. Awesome points. Thank you, Colin. How long did you wait, by the way? I was like 15 minutes, but you know, that's enough to, to throw things off. So that's, uh, yeah. when, you, when you're sitting there kind of looking at your watch, you know how time crawls by too, right? So, and it's just, you, got, you want to get home, you want to get on your, with your day and, and you got other people relying on you potentially. So, um, you know, one second, one minute and all that, it just kind of can, can throw you off so for sure thank you for sharing anybody else have a story about a handicap space violation i'll go uh this is when i was still in school at texas tech after my accident and uh, i was going to a basketball game and they had a sectioned off lot just for ada parking and i go in there and i'm driving up and down the aisles trying to find a parking spot there's uh, maybe a hundred spots in here and they're all taken. Well, I finally find one, I pull in and directly in front of me is another open spot. Someone pulls in with a like Corvette looking car. He gets out and sprints inside the building. And I was like, oh my God, why are you even in this lot? You should be in the regular lot. And so I got pissed off at that. I couldn't confront him because I couldn't chase him down. So. Uh, just people taking advantage of spots when they shouldn't be. Thanks for sharing, Joe. Yeah, that's frustrating. And, you know, that convenience factor that people fall um, uh, into, it just, they, they don't realize uh, the Joe that's sitting in the car or that wanted to get in and, and the fact that you physically can't now. Um, so it's mm -hmm. pretty sad. I'm sorry you had to deal with that. I think, Shaylin, I saw your mic come off. You got a story to share? I do. Uh, it was shortly after my amputation. It was one of the first trips out to go do something that didn't involve my amputation. And there was like four parking spots for handicap in this huge parking lot. And there's another handicap car parked diagonally, like blocking like three of them. I was amazed that it's somebody else that you should know better. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, wildly unacceptable, but you guys must have also seen, um, reminds me, you know, when folks are moving into a, like an apartment building and there's no places for them to put like their U-Haul or other, yeah, Kumain, I see you see me with this, right? They just park right through the middle of all the parking, the handicapped parking spots so they can unload their ramp. Well, ah, I guess, I guess all of us people with handicaps will just wait to access the building until you're done with your moving. But also, I mean, 
um, stores that are shipping items, right? I don't want to call it any of them, but you know, uh, any kind of shipping companies are, are big targets just because they're pulling in, they're dumping their stuff off and they're taking off. So it's a, it's a quick transition. Um, and, and then if you're in the spot, they'll park right behind you because it is in the front of the buildings. So I've been trapped in spots for periods of time because someone's moving or they're dropping off goods or they're picking up goods or whatever it might be. So it really creates, as Colin had mentioned, uh, an issue being able to execute my day in the way that I need to. Appointments, as you mentioned, that could be critical to get to. Uh, our timeline is not necessarily of concern. It's all about the convenience of that person. Um, and they're legally, I mean, they're violating the law. So that's what we want to really note here is that it is, it's impactful and it's concerning to us, but it's, it's also illegal. Um, so it's, yeah, that's, that's a great point, Shaylin, is when they take up multiple, like one's not bad enough, right? <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else in the group have a story about a uh, handicap space violation, just generally speaking? Okay. Um, all right. Next question. Have you ever avoided going out because you're concerned there won't be parking. I'll start with this. Um, when I was a new amputee, um, things were tremendously painful. And um, I had a lot of trouble just uh, navigating the snow and the ice in New England on crutches. Um, it was really just, it was terrifying. I fell a lot of times. Um, so any extra steps from the car to the door that were um, in my path were uh, like physically and emotionally concerning to me. And um, so enough times that I would go places and see that there wasn't parking, oftentimes again, because someone's missing the placard or the plate, um, I, I stopped going places and got like pretty blue about it, you know, and stayed in and had to ask other people to help me, which as most people know, is one of the hardest things ever to do when you have a disability is help asking for help. So it put me in a position where I didn't actually have the things that I needed because I was unwilling to go get them necessarily because I didn't want to have to get ready. I mean, when you have a disability, you take a little extra time to get going. I mean, as you do this for years and years and years, you build your systems in and it's, you know, it's an auto set, a checklist that you do and you don't think twice about it. But when you're newly disabled and that could be a range of brand new to weeks to years, it depends on how you feel. Um, you take extra time to get prepared and to get yourself prepared and to get all your accessibility equipment and to get yourself in your car and to get to the, you know, the store, whatever it is, you're already coming from a place of depletion. And then to get there, to recognize that there is no place that you can safely get yourself into the building, um, for me, created a lot of barriers to me wanting to get out and do things. Um, and the social, like psychosocial manifestations of that, depression, anxiety, um, are, are real for people because it's our way to connect with the community when we go outside. And if we can't do that, it renders us feeling pretty different and isolated and outcast. And we can spare that truly by just keeping these spots open. So anybody else have any avoidance, any, anything that they've avoided because of lack of spots? You know, I haven't completely avoided going out, um, but I've definitely, a, let's call it abort mission. If I've needed to go somewhere and there's there's no spots and it's a really full parking lot, uh, you know, you do the circle, you kind of wait for somebody and you kind of you sit there and hopefully somebody kind of comes out. If it's not something that's going to just be 100% necessary, but it was something that was a convenience factor. I mean, it was something that obviously I, I needed to get done or I wanted to get done. I might put it off for a day. Um, if there wasn't enough parking, if I needed to get going, if I needed to maintain this schedule, um, you know, you, you kind of just got to be cognizant of like you you want to you want to be able to just get in and kind of get out and of course you know there could be a scenario where it's it is full of legitimate handicapped placard users and, and that's kind of just the luck of the draw and, and in those situations i often look for parking in the back of a parking lot you know i'm i'm such that i'm in a manual wheelchair and i can roll for decent distances maybe through a parking lot but then you got to understand that i'm then committing a probably another parking violation on the other end of that parking lot because in, to ensure that nobody can park next to me i'm most likely going to double park and that can spiral into a, a whole you know avenue of things i could potentially get a ticket and now i'm looking at you know bringing this to a court or to a judge and saying hey listen there's a legitimate reason why i was doing this i just couldn't park and, and it snowballs into a whole hassle for me so i mean even that so it's kind of like social cycle and anxiety of is this going to create some kind of more problems for me? Um, a lot of people might just throw up their hands and just be like, you know what, I'm just going to do it another day. So having those, those spots open, that avenue for just kind of get in and get out 
it just allows you to be a functioning member of society and uh, something that's important for us to know that we're, we're able to do. And that's the reason why they're there. So. Yeah. That back end is a good point. Didn't even think about that. You know, the, the hassle, you're going to win the case, right? If you got a citation, but the fact that now you're taking more time out of your life to go fight this battle and, and the person that was the perpetrator initially, if again, it wasn't a luck of the draw and it was just full, they're, go they're long gone by now, right? Like they don't have the hassle again that you had to go through. Yeah, that's, that's a great perspective. Joe, I think I saw you come off. You got a story too? I do. Um, for me, pre-pandemic especially, I would like to go to concerts all the time. And unfortunately, those handicapped spots always fill up. So I went out of my way to show up hours ahead of time just to make sure I would have a spot close to the venue. Um, and in inevitably it would all fill up. But then the downside of that is now that you're close to the building, you have to wait till the entire parking lot empties before you can leave. So instead of going to a two hour concert, it turns into a five hour concert, just because you have to get there ahead of time and wait afterwards. So that part of it is, is inconvenient for me. Yeah, and you can tailgate at the front end, but you can't at the back end, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got any stories about uh, avoidance? Yeah, I would totally agree with all of them. A lot of it, it does, you know, depending on how you're feeling for the day, like there's been some times where I've had some serious skin breakdown issues where I have to count every step I take during the day because it is absolutely painful. And so you are going to, you know, like you said, do the drive-by, do the drive-through. Do I really need this product? Is, is it really worth that walk across the parking lot? And most of the time, no, it's not worth the pain of walking into the store, walking around the store, standing in line and walking back. And like they mentioned, there's only so many handicapped parking places in the begin with, and they can be filled with legitimate people. So that's a bigger issue. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Anybody else got anyone on this before we go to the next question? All right. What lengths have you had to go to because there wasn't enough accessible parking due to misuse of handicapped spaces? Um, I'll, I'll start with this one. So I went to um, a park. It was a beautiful day and I wanted to, um, I was in a wheelchair because I use it part-time uh, if I have long distances. And so, uh, but I like Colin, I, I'll usually manually, manually throw it together. I don't, I don't need uh, the ramp, nor do I have a ramp uh, in the vehicle, but still need a little extra space. Um, so I, and I oftentimes, and a lot of you guys can relate probably, I don't always park in the handicapped spots. Um, if I, you know, sometimes if I can park in a spot that's got like the little, you know, the trees and shrubbery next to it where I know I can get my chair together outside the door. Um, if I'm in the chair, I'll use that. And because I am usually not in a wheelchair, I can get out and have my prosthetic and I can walk if the spots are available that are close enough to where, wherever the venue is. So I'm, I'm lucky in that way. And I'll try to reserve those spots for folks that I know that need it, especially wheelchair users. But when I do need it, you know, 38 weeks pregnant Tina with one leg that <laughs> her socket barely fits, I'll use them. And in this case, I went to a park, wanted to just walk uh, and someone was in the spot and they didn't have um, a placard. And uh, so I, I'm not proud of this, but I parked behind them <laughs> and that's not legal, but it was in a space in the parking lot where it was not gonna impede anybody else's ability to drive in. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to have to wait for this person to get out of their legally, you know, maneuvered vehicle, then they can wait for me to do my walk. It's going to be 10 minutes or shorter. I wasn't going to walk very far, but I came back and they weren't there yet. So they didn't, they, it had zero impact on the, on the outcome. And I felt terrible about it and it wasn't legal for me to do it. And I don't recommend retaliation in that way, but I wanted to just mention that if someone has to do a thing rather than them avoiding they now become someone that is up against a wall with, well, do I have to violate now to be able to get the experience that I wanted or do I go without? And sometimes that's a hard battle to consider that you are less worthy of accessing that location and getting something out of it than the person that's there illegally parked. So uh, I wanted to share you know, a story where I wasn't perfect and I don't recommend it, but that um, I was able to get a walk in and there was no altercation or any issue. I did report them to the police. I don't know if they got, you know, a citation, 
but in that that would have been the correct thing to do it would have been for me to not go or find another parking spot and then of course call the pd and have them run the plates or issue a ticket some pds will also send the ticket to the registered owner of the vehicle um, without necessarily going to that location if you can send verification with photos um, so the other thing i wanted to mention too part of the story that we might not get to i've come across people that are um, using uh, spaces with placards but the placards don't match the car and or they're using someone's car that's a handicapped vehicle but they're not handicapped you have to know their personal situation to know that they're offenders but in a few situations i've come across that situation and i wanted to just share the information to people in the able-bodied community that it is issued to a person with a disability um, and that if that person is not present in the vehicle with you it is illegal to park and to use that placard in that vehicle so some folks might have a disabled mom and they'll be like, oh, I'm going to go grocery shopping in mom's car and they'll drive their mom's car to the grocery store. Just there's no real way for us to tell because you've got a legitimate. Um, it's just a moral thing and an ethical compass thing where and maybe it's an education thing. It is not specific to that vehicle. It's specific to the person with a disability and they need to be present for you to be able to use that um, that handicap pass or placard. I wanted to just mention that. OK, anybody else? What lengths have you had to go to? that uh, because there wasn't enough accessible parking due to misuse of handicapped spaces? Well, I've, um, I say during this, um, my son's football season, uh, we will go out to the city of Mansfield to a park where there's football fields. And normally when we get there, every single handicapped space is taken. So normally we'll, we'll circle around just to see if there's a free park, uh, if there's a parking space. If not, um, my wife normally would drop me off towards the gate or we just go and park and I just roll myself up to where the event is at. Um, that's happened a few times um, going down there. And then I remember um, another time we went to Ikea out here in Frisco and every single um, um, parking space was full. So we literally circled around until someone came out um, and moved out of a, um, a handicapped parking spot. And we were able to finally get in there because we have four kids. Anytime we're traveling, it's, it's six of us all together, you know, with, with the four little ones. And so since me being in the wheelchair, to me, it's much more accessible and easier because, of the, you know, because we're so loaded with children <laughs> that we can just get out and just be closer to the door and just travel, especially when we're coming out with products and things of that nature. So um, I've experienced that. That's the only thing I've actually experienced since me being in this wheelchair. Um, this past year, um, is there are times where if there's not a parking space, we're just going ahead and just find somewhere and I just roll myself up into the store, which is not a big issue to me. Thanks for sharing, Q. Anybody else have a story where they had to go the extra mile, uh, pun intended, because there was someone in a spot? All right, this is going to be a juicy well, one. I say, oh, I'm I was sorry. Just no. say real quick, um, if I'm traveling with somebody and there's people in the handicap spots, I'll have them drop me off at the door and then they'll go park somewhere and then come and meet me. But if I'm by myself, then there's not much I can do except walk a mile down the parking lot. Sometimes I can do that on a good day. Sometimes I can't. Yeah. And then, and then you bring up the whole topic of reliance on other people, right? Like we want to promote inclusion and independence within the disability community because just because we have a, you know, a physical impairment doesn't mean that we necessarily need to have a plus one to everything just to be able to access things. But in certain situations, as you mentioned, Joe, you got to build that person in sometimes just to ensure that you can meet your schedule, that you can get into the facility. And at what cost are they taking, you know, I know a lot of folks that are disabled that I, we, our organization will pay for transport because the, you know, the caregiver of the person with a disability can't take the day off to be able to drive the person to their doctor's appointment. They, they just physically can't do that again after years of disability. Um, you know, it becomes a financial burden for a lot of folks because, you know, there are appointments that need to be made and those are during working hours. So you bring up a great point um, by having to have an additional person brought into this, takes away your sense of independence and then also, you know, bestows a lot of socioeconomic impact that could be negative for that family. Thank you. Uh, okay, so there are lots of interactions, I'm sure, and stories of interactions out there with folks that have um, been parking in spots. You know, everybody's got good and bad days. And some days when you've already been inconvenienced or your fuse is short or 
your, your Zen is off, your Chi is bad, whatever you want to say, and someone's parking in a spot, um, there might be an altercation or there might be a conversation or it might have gone bad or someone, you know, whatever the situation was, there's, there's always tenseness that can be created if it's not really thought of as an educational opportunity, which uh, is hard to do sometimes when you're emotionally invested in the impact of what these people are doing negatively for the disability community. But do any of you guys have stories about uh, like a strained or a funny or a challenging interaction that was had with a violator of a handicapped space? Tina, you're on, uh, okay. So um, I went out to eat with uh, my coworkers one time and we went to Schlotsky's and I parked in one of the two handicapped spots. And uh, next to me was the, the striped area and then another spot. As I'm getting out of the car, uh, a dude comes and parks diagonal through that spot into the striped area right next to my door. And so I kind of bent down to look in his window. I was like, you know, what are you doing? He's like, shut up. I'm only here for a second. I was like, dude, this is for handicapped people. He's like, they bowed up on me. It's like, what are you going to do about it? And I was just like, dude, whatever, forget it. Because I didn't want to provoke him any further than that. So I went inside and had my meal. I came back out and he was gone. But just the fact that there are people out there who take offense at you uh, standing up for yourself, that's, that's an issue right there. Yeah, and that's why I recommended, and this is based on personal experience, not necessarily being the confronter you want to, and I understand it's, you know, it's hard not to sometimes, especially if you can't get in your car or you need to get out of your car, but it's, um, there's the, the kinds of folks that are um, capable of negating the the ethics involved with using these spots are not always folks that are reasonable um, and sets us up, especially as folks that have physical impairments and are, you know, more subject to predators, um, sets us up possibly for tough physical situations. So I'm glad that nothing happened. And I know it's really hard sometimes to bite your tongue um, and it's just a hard position, but yeah, just knowing that these folks already are in a position where they're not coming at it from our angle. Like our, pers our, our experiences shape our perspective. We understand and we get why it's important. They have never had something in their life that renders them able to wear the lenses that we wear. And so of course to them, you're just, you're just a bother. You're just inconvenient. And the path of least resistance is that you just stop <laughs> your, you know, your opposition to them. So I'm sorry you had to deal with that, Joe. Right. Thanks. Anybody else, any stories? I was hoping this one would be juicy. I'm glad it's not. That's actually a good thing. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we'll have some comments when we post this of people's stories. I'm sure we'll get something on the, uh, the old web. All right. What impact does the cold weather and holiday season have on this subject? I already led in with the fact that, in my opinion, the volume makes the volume and the need to get inside because it's chilly makes it more um, luring for people to want to take that convenient route. Is there anything additional that you guys would add to that that I might have missed? No, I think you did hit the nail on the head, but I'm, you know, I'm just going to jump in here. I think one thing that stores and especially busy stores can do to kind of mitigate this problem and kind of help assist and make sure that this, you know, uh, spaces are open for individuals, customers that are going to come in and actually shop and don't, don't leave the parking lot because they don't have a, a space to park. An example, this would be like Costco here in Chicago. Um, they actually have somebody patrolling those handicapped spots. Um, and running those numbers against the people who get into the car. I, I actually went up to him and was like, this is great. I'm glad, so glad you're doing it. It's one of the 20, you know, first times I've ever seen it. And as Q was saying, you know, he went to Ikea. Um, these, are, these are places that oftentimes you're expecting these spots to be full. Um, this isn't like a one-off thing. You know, that these are high traffic stores. Uh, you know, Target would be another example where, and Walmart, especially, right, these are, these are where there could be a lot of, you know, people that have legitimate, you know, opportunity to use these handicapped spots, but also very, very many offenders, I'm sure, that kind of go flying under the radar. So, um, you know, asking those stores, and maybe it's your own personal Walmart, where you consistently run into this problem, or my own personal Costco, where I consistently run into this problem, if they'd be willing to have somebody that's kind of dedicated to do a swoop through of that parking lot, and kind of, uh, a, make sure somebody's got a placard up. If not, they get a ticket. 
Um, and then B, you know, if they're even dedicated enough to have somebody that's actually sitting out there and kind of say, hey, does this, does this match up to you? Um, you don't really look like you need it. You know, it's something great. And some, some stores are actually willing to do that, especially maybe in the holiday season where people are trying to do some shopping. So. Yeah, that's, that's, and you bring up a good point too. I mean, the whole concept of like a call to action, right? So like incorporating these businesses to have a buy-in. When you think about 26% of Americans having disabilities, you're talking about a significant amount of revenue that these stores, let's just talk about bottom line, motivation, right? For businesses that, that they're going to be losing if we can't be consumers of their product, their goods, their services. So it actually is a, we, we represent a large enough demographic at this point that I feel like we do have some pull and that they do have some incentive to want to help us be able to actually get into their facility um, safely. So, and also safety, right? We talk about liability. So say you have to wheel from the back of the parking lot and, or say someone like Amanda has got a wound on her leg and she's having to hobble through uh, or someone loses volume in their amputation because it's cold out and they're not, they don't know how much sock ply they need on their prosthetic and they trip and they fall in the parking lot because there's a violator in the spot that's actually appropriate for them to have used. And now they just tripped and fell in the business um, parking lot and the liability that could come from that to the business. So it, there's a lot of motivators for these companies to want to have buy-in and to create a call of action. I think that's great. And I think going in there, like you said, and just saying, hey, saw somebody out there without a placard, you know, would you be willing to just take a peek at it um, and just hope that people over time recognize through things like this and these videos and also by their own living experiences with themselves or loved ones, how much of a big deal it is. I, I think that's helpful, but also a call to action for everybody in the community. Um, you know, just because you are not someone that works at that Costco or you work at that Ikea at, and that you don't use a handicap placard and you're not, you know, parking in the handicap spot, it doesn't mean that you can't be an advocate of the cause. You know, every time you're walking into the store, you're not parking in that handicap spot, but you are walking past it likely because it's right in front of the door. And you could give a quick survey and see if they've got a placard up or if they've got a plate up and you could maybe help with the cause and just go up and say, hey, saw a car out there that's not, you know, um, legally parked in the handicap spot, I wanted to just mention it to somebody, you know, so the more eyes and uh, that we have out there in the community, um, hopefully the more change that will that will happen. So that's a great point, Colin. Thank you. Yeah, one really easy avenue for people to do that is I believe the app's called Parking Mobility. Yes. I think I just looked it up. And uh, so you can Android or uh, Apple users can download that. And it's pretty easy to report people. Yeah, that's the one where you take the pictures right of the license plate. I believe so. Yeah, Parking Mobility. Awesome. Yeah. Everybody that's watching this, check it out for sure. Um, okay. Well, we have taken up a lot of everyone's time. Uh, we are over the 30 minute mark, I'm trying to keep it concise, but I am historically verbose. I wanted to open it up real quick though. Is there anybody that has a message, like a take home message for people that are watching this uh, or anything else that you'd like uh, to talk about related to the subject? I will say one last statement. And that is again, what we can do, right? We talked about um, the information related to handicap parking. We talked about the impact on people's lives when people are violating these parking spaces. And now I wanna talk about what you can do. So the solution to this issue is that you can either leave the spots open for wheelchair users if you have a disability and you're able to walk the distance from a normal spot. You can not park there if you don't have the legal placard or plate and avoid the lure of the convenience and oh, I'm just popping in for a second or whatever that excuse might be. And then you can also take the, the road to report. So whether you report it to the authorities directly with the app that we mentioned, or whether you go into the store yourself and just say, hey, take two seconds and just mention that someone's out there that doesn't have a plate or a, um, a placard and you would be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So that is my last statement. Anybody else have any other messages you want people to take home with them today? I would totally agree with you, Tina. Um, those people that are really tempted to use those spots, yes, it might. I mean, really, when you count the seconds that it's going to take you to actually walk into the store from the other side of the parking lot, you're really not saving any time. And just like other people have mentioned, you are costing multiple minutes to hours for somebody else. So just you know, pause and give that reflection. It really doesn't take that long to trot into the store. So you're really not saving time. Thanks, Amanda. And yeah, I would just say a, a little bit, a little bit goes a long way, both in your need for parking there for three seconds could mean the difference of me going into that store and completing my task or not, uh, circling the parking lot or 
you know, me just kind of holding on my day. And then also a little bit goes a long way in the sense that, uh, like you said, if the able body community kind of help out a little bit, keep out an eye, more ears, more eyes, everything kind of wins and things operate a little bit smoother. So uh, just kind of keep that rule in mind. A little bit goes a long way. If you're there for a few seconds, that's, that might be the difference of a big deal for me. So. Okay, great. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, all of the contributors to this, uh, thank you for taking your time out to help people understand the problem and what they can do to help fix it. Uh, for everybody that's watching and that stuck with us for that half an hour, I hope that you're leaving with some information, some knowledge, and some dissuasion to use those spots and some suggestions for how uh, that time might better be spent. Um, happy holidays from everybody at Less Leg More Heart and of course all the beneficiaries that joined us today. Thank you for your time. We want you guys to remember to be kind to yourself spread love and help decrease suffering to everyone that you can through the holiday season. Thank you all for being here. We'll talk to you soon.